this is the first time that I haven't been tripped up by the recording. So I'm proud of myself. Uh, if nobody else is proud of me today. Um, lastly, we want to um, emphasize that this discussion and, and most discussions facil facilitated by Rockland Graduate School follow the IGR community guidelines. So uh, what we want to do is ensure that this remains a, support, a supportive and respectful space for participants to learn, grow, and share their vulnerabilities. Um, let's all be mindful of the intent and potential impact um, our words may have on others as we discuss our thoughts in this particular um, this space here uh, today. Now that we've got the housekeeping out of the way, we, we will uh, move on to the star of the show. Uh, so today we have Dr. Dina Meyer Strau, um, who serves as a faculty uh, on, on the faculty at both uh, Fisk University. I have my Fisk colors on today as I uh, uh, it, Fisk holds a special place in my, my heart. Uh, and also, uh, she serves on the faculty uh, at uh, Vanderbilt University, um, but she's the executive director of the Fisk to Vanderbilt uh, Master's to PhD um, Bridge Program. She's been there since um, 2012. She's been a huge advocate for um, students and mentors to students from underrepresented and underserved um, groups into and through uh, STEM PhD programs. Um, she began serving as the director of the LSAMP Regional Center for Excellence and broadening participation in 2018. Uh, she does many more things like directs the Educational Research Center for the Fist to uh, Vanderbilt Bridge Program in collaboration with the Peabody School of Education at Vanderbilt and the American Institute for um, Research. Uh, she is uh, sh uh, a friend of the room as uh, she tends to respond when I reach out to her and, and, and does nice things for us and imparts her wisdom uh, from her experiences at Fisk and Vanderbilt. Um, so she may be familiar to some, but new to others, but I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Dina Meyer Strau uh, here this afternoon. So if we can give her a quick round of applause, use the emoji functions to welcome her this afternoon, that would be wonderful. And with that, we'll turn it over to you, Dr. Meyer Strau. <laughs> there we go. Okay, because I've got to make my thumbnails very small. So I can't really see all of you. So if I do need to stop for any reason, if there's a question or something that I need to pause for, somebody just tell me because I've got you all, I've got you all hidden. <laughs> so I am very glad to be here today to talk to you about the Fisk Vanderbilt Master's and PhD Bridge Program and some lessons we have learned to help us um, generate what we feel is a, is a real model for inclusive graduate education. Um, and so I'll also probably refer to this as the FEBB sometimes, or just the bridge. Um, so, okay, so what's the bridge program? The mission of the bridge program, it was created in 2004 uh, to increase underrepresented minorities in STEM workforce and academy. And the rationale was that more underrepresented minority students use the masters as a stepping stone to the PhD. So the program itself is a fully funded master's at FISC in either biology, chemistry, or physics. And within physics, we have astronomy and material science tracks. So the students then attempt to bridge to Vanderbilt or another PhD granting institution. They are not required to apply to Vanderbilt. They are not guaranteed to get in. We have them apply to a range of uh, institutions that are appropriate and uh, fitting for their goals. And so then the whole program is seven to eight years. So while the financial component, you know, is two years in the beginning and one year at the PhD, if they matriculate to Vanderbilt, we consider our students active bridge students, no matter what institution that they are in. And we provide this additional layer of mentoring and support as they're completing their degree and moving into their jobs. Um, and so small gains in absolute numbers can have a big proportional impact on a national scale. And this is particularly true in physics and astronomy, which is where the bridge programs began. So just looking at the survey of earned doctorates in 2019, um, you can see in, in the physics PhDs that were awarded, um, only 1% went to Black or African-American students of the US citizens and permanent residents that earned PhDs. And for astronomy, 
in 2019, it was zero. And so there are some data that indicates from between like 2013 to 2017, there were 24 PhDs in physics and astro that went to Black or African American students. And almost half of those students came through the bridge program. So we have a real outsized impact um, on this field in particular. Um, so, you know, one program when schools are only um, having very few every few years can make a can make a significant difference. And just real quick, just to say again, obviously, this um, this was part of the reason that you know that we were created in 2004, and unfortunately, here we are, and we're still in this situation. So there's a lot of more work to be done. So where is the bridge program? So, okay, so Fisk is a historically black college university. Um, Vanderbilt is a massive um, R1 and we are two miles apart. I think that two miles has shrunk because Vanderbilt keeps just stretching out. Um, and so uh, the two mile, you know, the geographic location that makes it very easy to get in between the institutions, which is really important because the students are taking classes at both campuses um, some of their research is at Vanderbilt, some of their research is at Fisk. We share resources in terms of scientific equipment and core labs. Um, and there's a lot of interaction. There's a lot of opportunity for interaction between the faculty at Fisk and at Vanderbilt, and then also at the students that are um, in the PhD and in the master's. So this is a little bit of an old slide. So our basic student demographics though of about the 150 students we've admitted so far, it's about 59% African-American, 24% Hispanic or Latinx, 4% um, other minority, including Native American, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander, 14% um, white or other non un underrepresented minority. And we're about 51%, 49% male. Actually, I think that might be a little bit more like 54% female right now, following the uh, trends of, of um, more women uh, graduating and enrolling. But I would say, even though we don't formally track it, that about 90 to 95% of our students are from underserved uh, populations. So you know, first generation students or low income students or um, have physical or learning disabilities, right? And so the program itself has these four core tenants. So this was created in the, in the beginning when the program was founded along with Columbia University's Center for Institutional and, and Social Change. Um, the first being building research-based partnerships. This is joint research as an engine of institutional collaboration. And this is also recognizing the, the notion that the most seamless sort of transitions for students potentially between MSIs and PWIs is between faculty collaborations, right? Um, or even just faculty relationships where there's a lot of actual handshaking between the two places where there's a real um, mutually beneficial uh, relationship that then can sort of exist independently of, of the program. So the second is identifying students, you know, really increasing the talent pool. So these are folks that, you know, I mean, it says diamonds in the rough, but what it means is that they, they may not look like what a traditional um, metrics would recognize as um, a solid PhD candidate but they clearly have what it takes. And, and moreover, for us, it, we want to be able to serve. So one of the first things that we look at when we're looking at students is how can we serve this student? You know, do we have the research? Do we have the training? And is this um, someone that who we have the right resources to nurture their potential? And that's very important for us. So then there's also um, the continually monitoring sort of the second derivative, right? So not waiting for there to be um, a change in the, in the trend, but to actually you know, detect inflection points and to intervene with support early. So this is a very proactive approach and it's a real wraparound mentoring structure. And then finally, we wanna leverage professional networks connecting students with the broader community 
um, for mentorship and research opportunities. And then also really providing stage specific professional development um, across the board. So intensively sort of in the master's phase, but keeping that up as we go along with different stage specific um, opportunities and, and align, alignment of resources that are going to help people get to where they wanna be and to get to that job. So it's really important for us that they have internal and external networks. So some of the program outcomes, there's been 120 master's degrees awarded, 94% of students who earned a master's applied and went on to PhD. We've got 41 PhD graduates now, which is just great. And when I started, there were three. And so, um, We've got a 10-year completion rate of 88%. Uh, the students actually earn about twice as many fellowships and publish equally to their counterparts um, when we compare them to Vanderbilt PhD students. And we've had eight career awards associated with the uh, bridge program for junior faculty. Okay. So, but today I was just going to, I'm going to focus mainly on um, community building and then some of the research that we've been doing around our mentoring and community building, around our practices that students have said are associated with success. So, so we're gonna talk a lot about the sense of belonging of the Bridge family, um, including like solidifying our cohort, our, our professional development course, um, social activities, and then also our, our research day. So, but it all starts with the bridge family and the notion of it being a bridge family. And so in all of our recruitment materials and in all of our conversations, we center the students. And we, we want to set this tone of it being a family from the time that they are admitted. Um, we try to have a welcoming committee to, to get them to get them started, you know, we we take these pictures right off the bat. You know, there there's there's just a um, a genuine sort of feeling and expression of this of this notion of of the bridge family and what it means to be a part of that. And so that really starts on the very first day at orientation. And there's also a level of transparency that I think helps us build that idea of family, right? So we actually explain the whole model to them, why we need it, what the rationale was, how it's paid for, right? And, and all the people that have come before them and the network that we are building and how they are part of something that's so much larger than themselves and that they are going to be a part of this, of this family, of this community for as long as they want to be a part of it. Um, and really, you know, they've got to sort of disown us <laughs> because we just want to, um, we really want to stay with our people. And we spoke, focus a lot on the expectations, you know, what they can expect from us. And of course, what the actual expectations are for them, for research, for coursework, for engagement. And we talk about the things that are going to go wrong. We talk about the fact that there are gonna be bureaucratic problems. There are gonna be logistical snafus. We are gonna make mistakes as people and we want to be able to be honest with them and to have this be a collaboration and a partnership um, and, and to engage them in the actual process of, of the program. So in fact, they will go on to be representatives on our steering committee, right? So we engage them as part of the leadership as well. So following orientation, but before classes start, we have a few weeks where we get to do boot camp. So there's two different ones. There's one for biology and chemistry and one for physics and astronomy. Bio and chem focuses on things like lab safety, finding reading primary literature, maybe biostatistics. Um, and then uh, astronomy and physics is very much focused on the math review and computational skills. And there's a lot of um, 
there's a lot of things that are peppered into that. So yes, it's academic, right? But we buy their lunches all week because they don't get paid until two weeks after they start. So they've just moved here. They've made this financial investment. So we try to support them with having some, with having lunches every day for those couple of weeks, some dinners, some social events that are just for them so that they can get to know each other. Um, and then we have a few things such as meeting the directors, having Q and A sessions with the with the executive director, assistant director. So there's a chance for them to ask questions and to get to feel comfortable. And this year, we're going to start a new pilot program actually, where we're going to have a mental health professional come and talk to them two or three times about some basics of care, of mental health and self care, and finding doctors. Um, so that they can feel like they can get on a solid footing with their mental health. And then that same professional is gonna be offering a wellness short course um, during the semester. And so to be able to sort of amp that voluntary participation, we're hoping to introduce that during, during boot camp. So the primary function then is really to build shared experiences and to give them time to get to know each other because the more the cohort gels, by far the better off that, um, that it goes, both just personally, academically, um, having that support for each other. Um, and so for us to be taking the time to build that support uh, and providing the space for that to, to, to come, um, is really important. So then even though they're in different tracks and they are in multiple different labs um, and, and very few of them are even on similar projects, to be honest. So they're very spread out. Um, they do keep some courses together, which is good, but the only one that they're gonna be all be in is the professional development year long course. And this is just a once a week, half a credit, but the, they're all there. And so in the first semester, we start off with really um, diving, in, diving in pretty deep actually on things like imposter phenomenon, stereotype threat, and you know, the myth of meritocracy and the reality of discrimination in STEM and in STEM higher education in particular, right? Um, so, and also doing things like values affirmations, but, but being very honest about the fact that especially as they're moving between uh, you know, an HBCU and a PWI, what is, that, what is that like? And what sort of discriminatory activities or sort of exclusive attitudes they're, they're gonna potentially experience um, you know, from that PWI. It's also a time for them to connect with their advisor and to really understand their projects. So that's good, it gives them this good grounding. Um, it helps to you know, build a relationship with their advisor early on. And then the second semester is very much focused on writing and preparation for that PhD application and also research ethics. Um, but by then we've really built a lot of um, camaraderie between the students. And so it can be a really productive, uh, you know, the, the sessions are a very productive time. And I think one of the things that's important for this, that again, brings in this notion of, of community is that um, it's a student driven structure. So every semester, the students review the entire syllabus with me and, and we discuss whether or not things are in the right place or whether or not they're even the right things. And we make adjustments every year based on how the students felt that they were having their sort of professional development needs met at the right times by what we were offering. Um, and that's been really helpful to make the course be something that was a very passive sort of thing to begin with when, when we began to this much more um, engaged and active uh, group. So I so I, I want to talk a little bit here about the about the mentoring structure and about the um, you know the overall intentionality of the way we do things. So you know we have specific goals and then we have activities that go with those goals, right? So first, for example, we want to assess course performance. 
we send the letter to the faculty at the beginning of the semester and say, okay, this is a person that you've got in this class. They're a bridge student. They have these additional supports. This is who you contact if you've got any worries whatsoever. And, you know, please let us know if you've got any questions at all. Um, and then we're going to be checking in with you at mid-semester. Mid-semester, we send a check-in. We get way more of a response because we've sent this initial semester letter. The same thing with just establishing our relationships. There's a very there's a very personal introduction. Um, I spend time telling some of my own academic story and my own personal identities and sharing my uh, my history, you know, with the students as they as they come in. And we also spend time sharing our stories. Um, the administrators themselves during boot camp and other things like that, so that there's this recognition and there's a verbal recognition that your identities matter and that we want you to bring yourself to this group. Um, and then also, you know, having a lot of planned one-on-one -on -one time and other types of activities. So this list of things we do is enormous, right? There's all these goals and activities, timelines and check-ins, but th the important thing to take away is just the sheer intentionality of it. Um, and so that's, that's a, it's a really useful way to ensure that you're accomplishing the things you want to accomplish, um, or at least you are planning the activities that are going to address the things you want to accomplish. So we also really spend a lot of time building mentor networks. So we do this, there's a couple big events that we have. And the first one is um, what we call the mentor mixer. And so this one, we invite students, postdocs and faculty. Um, and we sort of have four main areas of where we're telling people to seek out uh, mentorship. This is academic, career, accountability and social emotional. And so we let people, we've done this three or four different ways. So we've done it almost with sort of speed dating a little bit um, or being able to um, just move through sort of section section with a set of set mentors in particular areas. And it doesn't really make that much of a difference how we structure the event. It's more important that we have the event. So we facilitate connections, but what we found is that not as many connections actually get made or sustain, but the students report every year and have reported in our studies that this event is meaningful to them and that they feel that it is helpful to make connections even if they don't become formal mentoring connections. Okay? And so uh, Research Celebration Day is another, um, really it's, it's our sort of, it's our central event of the year and this was this was created by a former student whose motivation was to really know what everyone was doing in terms of their science and so we decided to um, make it a, a very student focused event so there's not they we invite an alumni to, to give a keynote all the talks are done by students all the talks are selected by the student committee um, it's all student poster sessions, and then there's a really big welcome dinner with faculty, et cetera. There's always t-shirts and swag, and it's, um, it's really like a, it's a hallmark event. And it's one of, because it's one of the few times that we can get together folks from all the way across the masters, from the PhD, you know, together and to really, um, really hear what, uh, each other is doing, which is one of the things students always love to have as an event. Um, and so a small survey that we did last year, um, eight, uh, 18 students replied, 89% reported that the bridge program helped them build mentor networks. Um, and we also teach them early on what a mentor network is, what it looks like, who you are, you know, thinking about who you're missing and how you might be able to build that. So I talked a little bit about the proactive, um, and wrap around mentoring. And so what does that look like for us? Um, I stole this from Mary James from Reed College, who says, you know, essentially whatever academic, whatever affects your academic life can be my business if you want it to be. It's just a very important concept that there are things that are going to be happening outside of these walls. We don't expect that you are coming into a little science bubble and putting everything down and putting all your other selves down, right? And and just focusing on, on, on being a scientist. Um, and 
you know, when I say proactive, I really just mean, you know, it's highly planned, right? And so having things planned means that you're also getting a lot of communication. You want a high level of communication between all of these folks. You know, you want to be able to be talking to everybody that interacts with the student, their near peers, their peers, their advisors, their instructors, you know, the, the administration team. Like everybody in the in the in the community, you want to you know sort of be getting a feel on where things are. So it's it's reasonably intrusive. I have some people that that sort of push back against this notion, but it's really just a matter of of asking, um, you know, how things are going and how people are, and and making time and space to just talk about whatever is going on with that student at the time. That not with an agenda necessarily other than to connect, right? And most importantly, it's not deficit-based. Um, there's never this question of what is wrong with you. Um, you know, it's more about what's going on that's impacting you. So sometimes, you know, I'll have a professor call me, of course, and be like, I just don't understand how to motivate this student. And I don't know why they don't have this or that and the other. And, you know, and instead of, instead of trying to understand what's happening at the time they're trying to analyze what's wrong with the student. And that's definitely um, not our approach, right? And we try to, we try to really maintain this, this very positive and connected way of, of mentoring. So after all of these years, we've had lots of different places that have wanted to use the model, right? So the APS came and they built their bridge program on it. And that has now turned into the inclusive graduate education network with the American Chemical Society, with the Geophysics Society. So a lot of people have used the model um, or used the tools which are available, um, a lot of which are available on the website but we never had a sense of what was actually, you know, data-wise important for folks. Like what do people say is matters to them? So some of the questions that we had, and this is just a, a sort of a couple of them, um, is how does mentorship complement the Bridges efforts to build a sense of community? And what academic supports and activities are perceived as most critical to students' preparation for and transition to a STEM PhD program? So we wanted to be able to tell folks we're looking at the model okay, here's what's really important. Um, here are the things that you really wanna focus on being able to adapt and adopt. And so what we did with the American Institutes of Research and Peabody School of Education as part of our um, NSF Sponsored Center of Excellence is we had interviews over um, two and a half years and uh, with sometimes with repeat students, sometimes with different students. And then there was um, a student survey which I already mentioned, and a social network analysis, which I'll talk about later. So, okay. So, so the most important thing that we found is the sense of belonging. This is the thing that people represent, um, you know, say most is uh, important to their to their success, to their retention. Um, in the student survey, 73% of students report high levels of camaraderie with fellow students, with their fellow, with the faculty in their departments, 78% um, with the program administrators, and 89% report camaraderie contributed to success. And I see this as a small number of students, you know, the answer to the time, but this is not actually the first time we've done this student, this type of survey. And we had a very similar nine, around 90% of folks um, say that the community or the camaraderie, um, you know, is part of their, is part of their success in the program. So here's some of the qualitative, you know, findings from the interviews um, that the students report, you know, in the bridge program, I didn't compete with anybody. I felt like we were all in this together. I think the bridge program, because it's a family, when I need people to lean on or people to talk to, that's who I go to. Um, I knew going in that my cohort would be a group of people that would be my friends and peers, but I'd not realized just how close and how important they would be to me. Um, I think the things that helped us facilitating us build that strong initial connection was probably the most valuable thing. So this was really, um, this was really great to, to see that uh, the recognition of, you know, the intentionality and the proactiveness in, in building this sort of space 
um, this counter space really uh, are, are helpful. So, and then in the other, one of the other parts is this attention to transitions. So during the very, during the first phase, it's really, during the master's phase is pretty intense, right? So during the first year, we're really making this undergrad to master's transition. Um, and then you're making this master's to PhD transition within in year two. And then, you know, you've got years one, two, three, to, as you're working on PhD candidacy, um, and then PhD candidacy and PhD completion and first job in years, you know, four through six, right? And so we have activities that are associated with each one of these uh, transition points. So here's just an example of maybe some traditional milestones. You have orientation, qualifying exams, proposal, thesis defense, right? For a PhD, for example. For us, there's, you know, the all of these act, things act as checkpoints. So orientation, professional skills, the they meet with me every semester, um, three times a year, uh, the PhD applications, the master's completion, the PhD transition, the qualifying exams, right? Um, dissertation and thesis defense and job applications. And so we, we spend a, a bit more time um, in each of those areas and sort of keeping track of where folks are. Um, I try to meet with all the PhD students every year, but also keeping note of, okay, when are your prelims coming up, right? Okay, how can we help you? Putting that in the thing, being, you know, checking in, me checking in with them, not waiting for them to check in with me about whether or not they need a hand practicing their prelims, practicing their calls. Um, looking at their documents, anything like that, right? So just continually sort of offering, putting that, putting that out um, in a in a planned way around these around these transition points um, also came out in the study as being really important. So then, just in general, the students reported some academic and professional supports. We provide conference attendance, um, one during the master's phase, and then another in like years four and five to assist in finding a job in the PhD phase. Um, and then, you know, they also report the academic navigation skills, things such as, you know, the culture uh, changes that they're going to experience between MSIs and PWIs. Um, and also just the, uh, you know, relationships with mentors, uh, other academic, um, you know, cultural sort of unspoken things, and then science communication. So we spend a lot of time helping folks learn to write and to present, to communicate their science well um, in a way that is safer than their maybe their own lab or or um, or with their. Uh, with their peers sometimes, right? If they're if they feel like they're having trouble getting started. So here's here's a, just a few things. So it's having the student reports, I was having issues putting together a presentation, focusing on the main ideas of the paper. Um, I came here and the FBP admin gave me an outline of how to break it down, how to go through and prepare the presentation for a journal club. And now I'm confident. It's like I come in here with my confidence, just it's pretty much not there. It's diminished. And then I leave out of here and she builds me back up again. So um so there's so there's a there's an aspect of it that is not just about the communication skills, but about the boosting and building of self-efficacy and taking those opportunities to show students how far they've come. That's one of the nice things about having this long-term relationship is you're able to reflect back on the student and and put out there and really demonstrate like how far um, how far they've grown, right? So um, so so we also asked a question about the role of support networks, and this is where the social network analysis comes in. And so what we did was we asked them about their types of interactions and their frequency of interactions. So we looked at a couple different areas. We did internal to the bridge, for example, the administrators or their cohort. We did external to the bridge and inside the institution, like their course instructors or postdocs. And then we looked outside their institution, such as the family or church and volunteer organizations. And we had a really high rate of response to the social network analysis. 
that's okay, pups. All right. <laughs> so and what we found was that during the master's program, students who go on to earn a, a master's um, have a greater breadth of supports than those who do not finish the master's. So you'll see there's this additional um, layer of, of outside organizations that those students that earn the master's have. Um, now, it wasn't predictive of their, you know, getting the degree, uh, but it was related. And what we did see was that those, um, that level, a level of engagement where folks felt like they had um, a, the, a support network, that, that, that could predict more of their sense of belonging. And that, of course, as we know, is this one of these key motivational components related to persistence. So they, so they indicated that the um, that having the social emotional support, career support, the number of people, the academic support, all had um, significant impacts on their sense of belonging. Okay. So just to sort of recap and and finish up. Um, the activities are intentional. The timing is proactive. The mentoring and opportunities are individualized. We really stress the folks that it's about their vision, that we're opening doors for them. They're doing the work. We aren't saving them. We aren't fixing them. We are opening doors and aligning opportunities, right? And the focus is on nurturing potential. And it's important to keep in mind that while this can have real positive impacts on diversity and inclusion, right? Especially once you've built this size of a community um, and where you have an inclusive, welcoming feel, um, it, it stops short of making differences in equity that we would really like to be able to see. So it, it has been very difficult to institutionalize these practices. You know, the astronomy department has incorporated them, um, but we have not made the same kind of inroads in physics or other departments um, across campus. And, and so there's a real need to go beyond this stage and look at the policies that are responsible for the exclusion of students to begin with. Um, which is you know, really why these people are not in the space, right? They're, they're being excluded, they're being marginalized. Um, and so it's, it's really time to think about that next level and moving into um, equity. Uh, and so that's all I have um, for this presentation. So I will stop sharing and we can start to chat. Yeah. Uh, before we chat, can we just give a quick round of applause? Use your emoji. Uh, I thought that was an incredible uh, uh, talk there. Always uh, impressed by your thoughts and reflections. Um, so the the chat the chat is open. Um, please feel free to use your raise hand function, or uh, also you can unmute yourself to uh, engage engage in discussion. We have about uh, fifteen minutes or so, so I'll open the floor. Uh, Sarah Birch. Uh, um, has a raised hand. So go ahead, Sarah. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, wow, that was so informative. So grateful that I saw your post, uh, Edmund, on LinkedIn. I was able to come and participate today. Um, the question that I was wondering about um, was like supporting uh, students with families. Mm -hmm. I know yeah. that you talked about like serving meals to the students kind of in that two week window. I didn't know if then. Mm -hmm if students had families, if they were given meals, or if there's like a child care stipend that the bridge program um, might offer, like on top of uh, already sort of like student parent sort of benefits on campus. Um, just wondering how student parents are supported. Yeah, so that we don't have any monies to support the families. Um, for, for those types of meals, the, um, those are typically just for the students, but so for all of our other activities, all families are involved. So children are always invited, spouses and family and friends, everybody is invited to those activities. That, And we also um, we also started buying to-go boxes and having those with the things so that people would like, you know, buying the bulk 
and have people pack up. And so they're taking more than one meal home at least. Um, so yeah, if we can send dinner home for the family, we're really happy to send dinner home for the family. And I think people sort of will, will also even, you know, recognize that. And then we do, we have a hardship fund as well that's available um, that, that we can do things like buy tires, um, you know, or uh, some unexplained. So, you know, if you do have something like that, unexplained medical bills, like it's not, you know, um, it's not something that has to really get approved. We have, we have those things. And we just try to be family positive and supportive of our folks with children for sure. Um, and invite the spouses, engage the spouses, invite the children, and then just, you know, help wherever we can. If it's finding schools, um, daycare, you know, just using our own personal networks and experiences. Thank you. Great. Thank you for that question. Uh, Mark has a question. Thanks, Dina, for the overview. Uh, could you tell uh, us a little bit more about uh, the mental health aspect, uh, recognizing how important well-being is. Um, and you mentioned that it was not only right at the beginning in the orientation, but throughout the program. Well, so this is a totally new, this is a very new pilot. So last year we did for the first time, it was like an eight week um, sort of graduate student wellness program. Um, and that is with someone that has, you know, their, their work has focused specifically on marginalized students, specifically on students in HBCU. So we were really lucky to find this person in our community. Um, and then, and we have been able to, you know, modestly pay him to do this work. And so this year, what we're going to do is have him come and do these sessions. One that are just about like general self-care, another that is also focused more broadly on like, how do you find a therapist? Um, what are your, what are your options? Because so FIST does not have one person dedicated to mental health services um, for students. Just not, not one. <laughs> So while they have like a counseling center, everybody is part-time. So this is a real issue for us. And um, that's one of the reasons that we built the hardship fund was to also pay for co-pays for, for therapy or other types of um, those costs. And then, um, yeah, so, so recognizing that the discriminatory environment that you are going to be in is going to have an impact on your mental health and that this is not something that that um, is is you or that you can just you know talk your way out of like this is these are these are real um, and we want to be able to have things in place to help you and we want to be able to help you get connected to um, you know to therapy if you need it to psychiatry if you need it and so it's really a very sort of um, we just try to we try to give people this resource this extra mental health layer of resource and then, and use that expertise to connect them. And if it costs money that they can't afford to pay for it. Does that, does that cover the? Thank you very okay. much. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Herbert. Yeah. Uh, so I just wanted to understand the mechanics a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are the, are the students admitted to Vanderbilt or to Fisk or to Fisk. To, they admitted to Fisk for the master. Yes, that's right. Okay, so they are entirely considered Fisk graduate students. They are they are considered Fisk graduate students, yes, but they have Vanderbilt IDs and they enroll in Vanderbilt courses and they have access to like Vanderbilt digital resources and are like wellness resources and any other like graduate events or anything like that. The only thing they can't use is the mental health services and the physical health services, but they're, they're, they're open to being a part of any, everything else. Uh -huh. Okay. So their master's degrees are from Fisk. That's right. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Roy, mm -hmm. you're up. 
Uh, yes, thank you for the uh, insights. Uh, it's very useful. Could you uh, give us a little bit more background on why some of the departments you mentioned were a little resistive to some of the ideas that you described, which seem to me kind of no-brainers generally, but why where's that resistance coming from? Um, there is still a fundamental notion that GRE scores are related to capability, to be honest. Um, there is still a reluctance to let go of these quantitative measures. And I don't have the slide here, but our students, you know, are just not, they're not going to be there. Um, they don't overall, I mean, I have, I have so many data points now, right. And so many points that show, I can show you the scores for, for all the people that have already graduated with their PhDs that just don't make the cutoffs for, for um, most of them don't make the cutoffs for, for these types of um, programs. And, and there just isn't the attitude of mentoring as craft, in my opinion. So that this is just me talking that I, that I don't feel like there's the kind of recognition of mentoring as being a thing that we should be developing and working on um, in the same way that we work on our teaching. Uh, you know, there's, there's still just this sort of notion of if they can't get it with what I'm giving them, then that's just too bad. Yeah, thanks. We've been fighting the GRE quantitative uh, metric quite a long time now. I think we're finally making some headway uh, collectively. Uh, yeah, I know. I need to. Of, I should publish that data. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Would help. Yeah. Anyway, we'll keep keep plugging away. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for those questions. So we, we still have uh, a time for uh, at least one more question. Uh, so if there's some some uh, one last question out there, please feel free to put it out in the uh, atmosphere. I'll give a brief uh, pause here. So I don't have any, I don't, I don't see any hands. I, I, oh, sorry, Emma, go ahead. I was going to wait and see if anyone else had a question. Um, I was just curious, are there any department level program, like, is there anything happening more at the department level to support these students? And then how many, you know, is there a little bit of a cohort size within each program? If that, may, um, so like how many students would be, are in physics or in, you know, some of the other departments? So once they get to their PhD? No, yeah, during the master's. Okay, so our cohort sizes are, are somewhere around um, eight to 10. And so it's usually um, over the last couple of years, it started to be split 50-50 between like bio and chem and physics and astro. And so like this year, I think we've got, you know, four physics and astro. Next year, we're going to have five physics and astro. Um, and five bio and chem, I think, or four bio and chem, right? So we try to have a minimum of two people in each track, um, or at least like, you know, sometimes we only have one chemistry person, but they do take, they take so many courses together that at least they, that together feels like its own, you know, group. And then physics and astro feels like its own um, group because they really take their courses together, right? So, but we try not to take any less anything less than two each each time. Thank you. Uh, so I ask one last uh, last question. I'm surprised it hasn't come up yet. Uh, so I'm going to ask the funding question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, can you talk a little uh, to whatever if you can? Can you share a little bit about um, what what funding looks like um, to support such a program? Yeah, I mean. It's about two million dollars a year, mm -hmm. and um, it is a patchwork quilt uh, of funding. So NSF, NIH, Department of Education are the biggest ones. Um, we are writing grants all the time. We're writing right now on on something that will fund physics and astro for the next you know five years. Um, 
we, but we were very, very lucky this year to receive an anonymous million dollar donation. Mm -hmm. um, and we've been told that there is more money in trust that is earmarked for us in the future, which is incredible. Um, and that funded five students this year. We actually had more money than we could fill this year, <laughs> um, which is, you know, not a problem that you want to complain about, um, right. except that now we need to hire more faculty because that was where our, now we hit the wall. We didn't have enough faculty. We need more faculty. We got more money. Um, so yeah, that'll fund another five students a year after that. And then, but every year it's, it's a struggle and we always worry. Um, how many people we're going to be able to take, whether or not we're going to be able to build a, a full cohort. I wish it wasn't like that, but it is. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. I mean, the funding question is always important. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there's not uh, enough funding to support these sort of initiatives. And as you kind of alluded to, you know, these, there, there's these larger structural challenges that that exist that um, we, we tend to use language underrepresented minority. I prefer to say marginalized or excluded or whatever the case may be. Um, but again, these types of initiatives help, help to um, move, move the needle forward, albeit slow, but still forward nonetheless. So uh, thank you so much for your time, energy, and effort this uh, afternoon here. If we can just give one last round of applause. Hand uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> much appreciated. This is uh, the closing out our um, uh, MSI Coffee Chats for this academic year. We'll return again in September um, with additional um, uh, invited guests, uh, equally as dynamic or hopefully as dynamic as Dr. Meyer Stroud here. Uh, was here today. So thank you all for tuning in. Uh, the recordings will be made available uh, in uh, about two weeks or so, uh, give or take. And then uh, I'm always available for you all to uh, reach out to and help bridge any connections that I'm able to do. So thank you all. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Oh yeah, please feel free if anybody has additional questions to email me at dina.m.stroud at vanderbilt.edu. I'm very Googleable. <laughs> she is. You can find me. I really am. <laughs> Thanks so much. All right. Take care, everybody.